The most powerful Austrian in history was not some kind of a 19th or 20th century figure. No, the most powerful Austrian in history was a man who held dominions spanning across four continents. A man whose empire was the first post-Roman empire to be described with the phrase El Imperio donde nunca se pone el sol. A man who ruled from the deserts of northern Chile to the plains of Hungary. A man who was presented with unimaginable wealth and power since his birth and a man whose life was marred by dealing with older responsibilities that came with that wealth and power. This man was none other than the Emperor Charles V of the House of Habsburg. The first thing and the most important thing that needs to be understood about Charles is his genealogy and how that allowed for him to become one of the most powerful men in history. Charles's grandfather, Maximilian I, inherited the Austrian lands and the Holy Roman Empire from his father. Well, the Holy Roman Empire was technically an elective monarchy, but for simplicity's sake, let's say he inherited it. Maximilian also happened to marry Mary, the only child of Charles the Bold, the Duke of Burgundy, which meant that after Charles the Bold died, Maximilian became the co-ruler of Burgundy with Mary. Mary and Charles had one son, Philip, who was set to inherit all of their lands, i.e. Burgundy, Austria and the Holy Roman Empire. Philip was then married to Joanna, the daughter of Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabel of Castile. Joanna had an older brother and sister, but after they both died, Joanna, along with her husband Philip, became the heirs to Aragon, Naples and Castile. So, when Charles V was born to Philip and Joanna in 1500, he was the heir apparent to Aragon, Naples and Castile through his mother, and Burgundy, Austria and the Holy Roman Empire through his father. Also a couple of other titles here and there, but we don't have time to get into that. Charles was only six when his father died, and his mother was later declared mentally unstable and sent to a convent. Both Charles's grandfathers were still alive at this point, but once Ferdinand died in 1516 and Maximilian in 1519, Charles, at the age of 19, became the ruler of all his family's possessions. Now, despite the title of this video, in reality Charles was as much of an Austrian as he was Burgundian, Dutch, Walloon, Spanish or German. National ethnicity in the modern sense didn't exist at the time, especially not for multilingual and multicultural monarchs like Charles who spoke six different languages and who never had a capital city or a power center for his empire. A quarter of Charles's reign was spent just traveling with his royal court to areas of his realm which needed him the most. When Charles inherited Spain at the age of 16, and then the rest of his family's lands at the age of 19, a lot of other world-changing events happened in about the same time. A little-known priest named Luther had just nailed his 95 Thesis to a church door, a conquistador world over was illegally conquering one of the largest empires in the Americas, and the Ottomans had set their eyes on Hungary and Vienna. But before Charles could deal with any of that, his most immediate concern was the fact that four of the seven Roman Empire electors threatened to vote for the French king Francis I as the next Holy Roman Emperor. Obviously, if Francis became the next Holy Roman Emperor, it would be a disaster for the Habsburgs, and so Charles pretty much spent all of his money bribing the electors to vote for him instead of Francis. In reality, the electors never actually wanted to vote for a French king, they just wanted Charles to pay them a lot of money for their votes, which he did. Charles acquired all this money from his inheritance, bank loans, and by raising taxes in Spain. The raising of taxes in Spain right at the beginning of his reign created fears that Charles would not pay much attention to the country and would only use it to fund his German possessions, and therefore some of the Spanish subjects rebelled. However, Charles couldn't stay in Spain to deal with the rebellions because he had to go to Germany to be crowned as the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire and he also had to meet with Henry VIII before his famous Field of the Cloth of Gold event. How Charles dealt with issues like this, where he was needed in multiple areas at once, was by delegating his royal duties to viceroys, regions and royal representatives. In fact, a large portion of Charles' reign was just delegating, because as one of his advisors once told him, you are not a god who can be everywhere at once, but an emperor who must walk upon this earth. So keep in mind, as I talk about Charles' life, even though I don't mention them for the sake of brevity, there are many people that are helping and 
influencing Charles' reign. Going back to Spain, the viceroys Charles left in charge of Spain while he was gone managed to eventually quell the rebellions. While in Germany, for his coronation, Charles was presented for the first time with the problematic teachings of Martin Luther. Initially, Charles' response to Lutheranism was very mild. This may have been because Charles was playing Luther against the Pope in order that the Pope acknowledged Charles' coronation as the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire and would later also crown him as the Emperor. Or it could have been that Charles thought this was just a theological debate that would resolve on its own without causing much trouble, or he did not want to start the pot much while his viceroys were trying to put down a rebellion in Spain, or all of the above. Whatever Charles' initial thoughts towards Luther might have been, the longer Charles stayed in Germany, the more it became clear to him that he could not simply ignore Luther's growing popularity. Charles, a devout Catholic, personally found Luther's teachings heretical, and therefore, despite the reasons stated prior, Charles eventually decided he had to confront Luther. This is why Charles summoned Luther to the Diet of Worms in 1521, promising him safe passage and a fair trial while he pled his case to the royal court. This was a big mistake on Charles' part, for it gave Luther a much bigger audience and platform than he ever had before. During the trial, Charles was hoping to showcase to everyone the theological problems with Luther's teachings, but the inexperience of the still young emperor revealed itself and Luther's defense was quite successful in convincing some of the German princes to his cause. After the Diet, Charles realized the mistake he had made and quickly proclaimed Luther's teachings as a heresy and forbade the printing of his books in the HRE. But he did not imprison Luther for he did promise him safe passage. While at the Diet, Charles also appointed his younger brother, Ferdinand, as the regent and governor of Austria and the Holy Roman Empire, while Charles was away taking care of his other dominions. Charles also secretly agreed that Ferdinand would become the heir to the HRE and Austria, for even now, early on in his reign, Charles realized the dominions he had inherited were simply too large and too divided to be able to rule effectively by just one person. There was also pressure from various factions within the Habsburg family to appoint Ferdinand as the heir to Austria and the Holy Roman Empire, which probably influenced Charles's decisions as well. Going back to Luther, he had clearly shown himself to be a much bigger problem than previously anticipated, but before Charles could do anything more about him, his attention was quickly diverted to a new and more pressing problem of France declaring war on the Holy Roman Empire in 1521. Francis I, the King of France, was afraid of Charles's power, especially after his coronation as the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire. As that meant, France was surrounded by Charles's domains. Therefore, Francis devised a plan to preemptively strike Charles, hoping to gain an early upper hand and quickly sue for peace. In doing so, Francis hoped to secure the integrity of France, especially of its Italian possessions, for the immediate future. This wasn't a completely terrible idea, as Charles had no money at the time because he spent it all on bribing the electors, and during the war he even had to deal with Lutheran-inspired rebellions starting in 1522 and 1524. However, despite all that, the war proved to be a disaster for Francis, for it only united Charles, the English and the Pope in an alliance against France, and helped Charles solidify control in Germany by presenting them with a common enemy. Francis even managed to to get imprisoned in 1525 by Charles's forces fighting in Italy. With Francis captured, Charles did not only gain possession over parts of northern Italy, which would prove to be a continuous sore point for Francis, but he also could force Francis to sign a devastating peace treaty. Francis did not intend to keep his word, for he later said he signed the peace treaty under duress, but for the time being, after four years of war, Charles finally had peace and could focus on yet another matter at hand, marriage. Even though Charles had produced some illegitimate children with mistresses, in the eyes of the Catholic Church and the state, those did not matter. The fact that Charles was still not married and did not have any legitimate children was a major problem, and Charles was being continuously pressured by his advisors to marry as soon as possible. This was because marriage with children would not only secure Charles's royal line of succession, but it also would help solidify his royal legitimacy in the eyes of his subjects. Not to mention, 
mentioned that marriage at the time also brought with it a sizable dowry, which was very important to Charles because the putting down of rebellions in Spain and Germany, the securing of the Holy Roman Emperor crown and the war with France had left Charles not only with no money but also deeply in debt. Therefore, after the war, Charles wasted no time and got married to Isabella of Portugal whose dowry was very sizable. It would also theoretically allow his descendants to claim the crown of Portugal in the future. However, Isabella was Charles's cousin and the Pope was very hesitant to approve the marriage due to the close family relation. Despite how prevalent it was with the aristocracy, the medical dangers of endogamy were actually known at the time. The fact is, most nobles in power chose to ignore those medical dangers in favor of the financial, political and diplomatic advantages endogamy brought to their dynasty. That is why Charles pressured the Pope about the marriage, who eventually acquiesced and gave his blessing. Despite Charles never having met Isabella before their wedding, after they got married, they both fell in love. Diplomats to the royal court reported that they are always talking and laughing together, that the king stays in bed with her all the time, and that since his majesty met his lady, he does not attend to business as promptly as he used to. Some, I would say jealous, onlookers even stated that he was trying too hard to be a good husband. Both partners would remain loyal to each other and trust each other for the rest of their marriage, and Isabella often acted as Charles's regent of Spain while he was gone. After his marriage, Charles became aware that Francis would not adhere to the peace treaty he signed, and so yet another war with France began in 1526. This time, Francis managed to get the Pope on his side, stoking within him fears that Charles might want to control the papacy now that he had both northern and southern Italy under his control. Charles was so furious with Francis dishonoring the peace treaty that he challenged him to a chivalric duel, man to man, to avoid causing the death of so many Christians. Francis, to the disappointment of Charles, ignored this challenge. Charles then sent troops to Italy to fight the Pope. He even threatened that if the Pope does not step away from this conflict, he would set up a council with the Lutherans and will reform the abuses of the papal court himself. With this threat and an imperial army in Italy, the Pope became more than willing to negotiate. But at this point it was too late, as Charles's army, which had a sizable German Lutheran contingent, conquered Rome and sacked the city in 1527. The war was not over though, as the Pope, now in Charles's hands, refused to surrender while French troops were still alive and well. While all of this was happening, another disaster struck. Hungary was invaded by the Ottomans, killing the Hungarian king and subjugating much of the kingdom. Charles's brother, Ferdinand, was married to the sister of the now dead Hungarian king and so he inherited the lands through his wife which not only included Hungary but also Bohemia. This expansion of Habsburg dominions may seem positive at first, but this inheritance also meant that Ferdinand, and by extension Charles, also inherited the war with the Ottomans. So Charles was now at war on two fronts, and many of his advisors begged him to sue for peace with France, no matter how humiliating it may be, so that he could focus on fighting the main threat to Christendom, the Ottomans. Instead of listening to his advisors, Charles, who was broke and in debt, tried getting more money to raise more troops by issuing more taxes, getting new loans, and increasing the exploitation of the Americas. He also again challenged Francis to a duel. Francis could no longer ignore Charles' challenges and so he agreed to the duel. Charles then set a time and place for the duel, but Francis just ignored it and never showed up. Charles made sure to publish this entire exchange with Francis, which drastically raised the morale of his troops and his subjects, who started to view Charles as a chivalrous medieval king. The war with France would eventually result in Charles's victory in 1530, and Francis had to sign an almost identical treaty as before. With Francis out of the war, the Pope also surrendered, and agreed to finally crown Charles as the Holy Roman Emperor, and that's how Charles became the last Holy Roman an emperor ever to be crowned by the Pope. Having been crowned an emperor, Charles convinced the elector princes, with more bribery, to elect his brother Ferdinand as the next Holy Roman Emperor. This election was the culmination of the secret deal that Charles and Ferdinand had made a decade earlier, which stipulated that Ferdinand would inherit the Holy Roman Empire and Austria. With that said, for now Ferdinand would still serve under his brother who, after all, was the emperor. 
Having been crowned an emperor and having made peace with the Pope, Charles turned to the Lutherans whom he no longer needed as a bargaining chip against the Pope. Overall, despite Charles still being a devout Catholic, he became more open to some of the Lutheran ideas during his war against the Pope, and he did try to convince the Pope to enact some changes to the church which the Lutherans wanted. The Pope, however, refused. One historian later remarked that the Pope's dismissal of Charles's plea constituted another narrowly missed opportunity to prevent the splitting of the Catholic Church. While all of this was happening, Ottoman forces were defeated at the First Siege of Vienna. Due to these Ottoman setbacks, by 1533, Ferdinand finally managed to sign a peace treaty with the Ottomans, which resulted in much of Hungary falling under Ottoman control. This peace treaty, though, didn't really mean there was peace. Skirmishes and even battles along the border were not uncommon, and Ottomans even raided Charles's Mediterranean shipping. In response, Charles had to build a whole new navy to deal with the raiding. While Charles was dealing with the Ottoman threat in the Mediterranean, Francis attacked the Holy Roman Empire in 1535 for the third time. Francis did this because he was still bitter over his previous two losses and saw an opportunity to gain back control over northern Italy when the Duke of Milan died childless. Charles responded to this by challenging Francis to a duel again and Francis again declined. So Charles again published the conversation showcasing that Francis had not changed and is still a coward. However, this time Francis brought even more powerful allies to the war than the Pope. He allied with the Ottomans who had as much vested interest in the destruction of the Habsburgs as he did. In fact, France and the Ottomans were cooperating since the beginning of Charles's reign, but it was only in 1535 that a formal alliance was made between the two. Charles, getting himself even more into debt, fought a war on two fronts until he could sue for its somewhat favorable peace treaty three years later. The peace treaty, other than giving some minor concessions to France, didn't really change much, but the war did lower the prestige of France in European politics, because they dared ally with the infidels, the Ottomans. A year later, in 1539, Charles' wife, Isabella of Portugal, died. Charles was heartbroken and spent two months in solitude praying. Despite being clearly sad about his wife's death, he did eventually move on, and in his later life he was known to often flirt with the girls at his court and even had a mistress, but he never remarried. Going back to Holy Roman Empire politics, with peace secured, Charles turned to the now Protestant problem, as not just Lutheranism but also other breakaway Christian movements started to develop. At this point, the Protestants of the Holy Roman Empire, fearing a Catholic backlash, had made a defensive Protestant league. Charles, not wanting a civil war in the empire, called for another imperial diet in Regensburg in 1541 to resolve the heightened tensions. The diet, however, was unsuccessful to bring the two sides together and it even had to be cancelled early because Ferdinand, Charles' brother, had started a war with the Ottomans over the unresolved succession of the Hungarian crown. This new war with the Ottomans, unsurprisingly, Surprisingly, also brought Francis into the conflict a year later. After three years of war on two fronts, again, and going even deeper into debt to fund his armies, again, Charles managed to sue for peace with France, again. The peace treaty, again, didn't change much other than both sides agreeing to renounce claims on each other's lands. Three years after that, in 1546, truce was reached with the Ottomans, and so Charles could again turn to the Protestant problem. This time, Charles was no longer negotiating. Both sides had refused to compromise despite Charles providing many opportunities to do so, and therefore, Charles decided to resolve the problem by force and attack the Protestant League. This proved to be somewhat effective, as Charles managed to secure a quick victory against the League in 1547, but the problem now was what to do with the Protestants. Even though defeated, the Protestants wouldn't accept Catholicism, and Charles couldn't really kill all the Protestants in the Empire for a at this point it would mean killing a large portion of the empire's population. What Charles eventually ended up doing angered both sides of the religious divide. He declared Protestants heretics and denied them various royal privileges, but he also said they can practice their heresy until some future religious council or diet resolves the issue, basically kicking the can down the line. The Protestants were angry for being called heretics and being denied royal privileges, and the Catholics were angry because the Protestants still existed. 
But there was peace for now, and Charles, who was 47, started to postulate whether it was time to secure the succession of his empire. After all, due to all the intermarriages, the life expectancy of a Habsburg wasn't very high, and Charles had health problems his entire life. As one French ambassador to the royal court put it, the emperor suffered from three chronic illnesses, each of which sometimes became acute. The first is his hemorrhoids, which lead him to lose a lot of blood. Second, he's asthmatic with a constant draining of catar into his lungs, and sometimes a racking cough so strong that it is a wonder he has endured it so long. Third, he suffers from gout in his arms, shoulders and head so badly that in winter he climbed into some sort of a sauna in which most people would stay for a quarter of an hour, but he remains there the whole day. That he is still alive is a miracle and contrary to the laws of nature. Charles also suffered from a Habsburg jaw, which was so long that his mouth was naturally open and he allegedly looked like he was always about to say something even if he wasn't. Due to all these health problems and overall tiredness with the never-ending burdens of his office, in the 1550s, Charles began to prepare plans to divide his empire between his brother Ferdinand and his only surviving son, Philip. All that would have to wait, however, for Charles had one more war to fight. The Protestant League, angered with their previous laws, had been incited by the French to rebel in 1552, this time with French support. That same year, Ottomans also invaded Hungary. This proved to be the largest and most expensive war Charles would ever fight during his reign and, ultimately, it was a war that he had no chance of winning. Just one year later, in 1553, Charles was forced to sign a peace treaty with the Protestant League, stating he will make sure to recognize Lutheranism in a later imperial diet if they help him fight the Ottomans and the French, to which the Protestant League agreed. With the help of the Protestant princes, Charles was able to negotiate a truce with the French in 1555, which basically yet again didn't change much, and a year later also with the Ottomans who gained control over Transylvania. As you probably had guessed by now, all these peace treaties and truces were often broken or outright ignored, and they would be in the future. But for now, for a brief moment, Charles again had peace. And so he turned to the Lutheran problem for the last time, finally officially allowing, at the Augsburg Diet in 1555, for the princes of the Holy Roman Empire to be able to choose the religion of their realm, whether that be Lutheranism or Catholicism. However, other Protestant religions like Calvinism weren't allowed. During this last war, Charles' health problems deteriorated, and his gout became so bad that he could barely stand on his own. Therefore, Charles finalized the plans for his succession, divided the empire, and abdicated in favor of his brother and his son. Before we get to the abdication ceremony though, we must talk about Spanish America during Charles' reign. I have not mentioned America in the video because for Charles, America was a distant land, a possession on the edge of the world that in his eyes scarcely required as much attention as his European possessions. The emperor's copious correspondence with members of his family and his closest counselors scarcely contain any detailed references to America. This is not to say he didn't govern America or that he wasn't interested in it, but in general, America was never Charles's priority. Despite that, American gold and silver, acquired during conquests or in mines, was absolutely essential in funding Charles's numerous wars. For example, without Cortes' first treasure ship sent after his conquest of the Aztec Empire, Charles would have been bankrupt already during the first war with France in 1521. This was because before the war, Charles spent all his money on securing the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. The steady stream of gold and silver from the American colonies proved invaluable to Charles' constant wars with France, the Ottomans and the Lutherans. Charles even told Mendoza, the first viceroy of New Spain, that revenues from New Spain must increase because at present, as everybody knows, we need great resources for the defense of our holy faith. At the same time, however, Charles was a big proponent of acting with compassion and civility towards the indigenous peoples of the Americas. 
just months after Charles' coronation as the King of Spain, he presided over a council which debated how the native people were and should be treated. The main problem the council was trying to deal with was that the laws of Valladolid, governing the West Indies, which were set up by Charles' grandfather, were not being followed by the Spanish colonists. According to the laws, the Indians could not be enslaved without cause, they had to be converted to Christianity, taught Spanish, and the encomiendas, which were basically a copy of the Spanish feudal system with some alterations, could only be a certain size. Lastly, after two years of feudal service on the encomiendas, the Indians were supposed to become regular free subjects of the Spanish crown. But all of these laws were wholeheartedly being ignored by most of the Spanish colonists who, using the encomienda system as a pretext, enslaved most of the natives they found and forced them to work indefinitely without providing them with any of the benefits they were supposed to according to the law. After the 1517 council, Charles would send off certain masters to the Americas in order to enforce the laws more thoroughly, but these proved ineffective. Therefore, in 1524, still hearing of the brutality of the Spanish colonists in the Americas, Charles created the Council of the Indies, which was a governing body in charge of all the American colonies that was tasked with, among other things, to ensure the liberty of the indigenous peoples. Charles was so committed to safeguarding the liberties of the Indians that when Pizarro asked him for permission to settle Peru, he said he will allow it only if the process will be peaceful, because according to the available information, about the area, its inhabitants possess the intelligence and capacity to understand our holy Catholic faith, so there is no need to conquer and subjugate them by force of arms. Instead, they should be treated with love and generosity. Pizarro agreed to Charles' demands, but he definitely did not adhere to them. After the establishment of the Council of the Indies, and later also new viceroyalties and new audiencias, the enforcing of the laws still proved difficult, and one of Charles' advisors said that the only way to enforce the laws would be by sending a powerful royal fleet to the Americas. But Charles couldn't do that, because he didn't have the money for it. All of the money his dominions made continuously went to financing his European campaigns. Every time I mentioned Charles having no money or being in debt, he was often bailed out only thanks to the money coming in from the colonies. And herein lies the problem with Charles's conduct of the Americas. On the one hand, Charles needed the Americas to produce as much profit as possible so that he could fund all his European campaigns. But on the other hand, he didn't want the Spanish colonists to exploit the indigenous people. Considering the economic system that existed at the time, he could not have both. Charles' contemporaries knew this, and a senior Spanish nobleman who was arguing against Charles' tax raises told him that, I hold it a great disservice to his majesty, who is still young enough to enjoy these kingdoms for many years, to place them under such fiscal burden that in few years its inhabitants will be ruined just like the indigenous inhabitants of the new world. Charles wanting both the maximization of profits and love and generosity towards the natives meant that his royal decrees for the American colonies were often contradictory. When Charles was strapped for cash, he was often willing to tolerate Spanish colonial abuses if it meant he would receive more money. But when Charles had secured cash flow, his royal decrees always emphasized the liberties of the Indians and called for the arrests of Spaniards who did not comply. Mendoza, the first viceroy of New Spain, even complained that his majesty and his council of Indies and the friars waste so much time and so much paper and ink in doing and undoing, in giving grants that conflict with others and in changing the system of government every day. I would argue that Charles always wanted the Indians to be treated just like any other subjects of the Spanish crown with the same liberties and privileges, however, it was the conquistadors and Spanish colonists that held the power in the Americas, and, by threatening rebellion and withholding funds, they could force Charles to tolerate the abuses against the Indians. For example, in 1542, Charles enacted the new laws and ordinances for the government of America and for the better treatment and preservation of its indigenous 
indigenous inhabitants. These new laws aimed to preserve and augment the indigenous population and to treat them as free people and our vassals, which they are. Also, all enslaved natives, unless those enslaved due to a rebellion, must be freed. Encomiendas will cease to exist after their owners die, and no new encomiendas will be granted, and no new natives can ever be enslaved for they are now Spanish subjects. To most of the Spanish colonists, these new laws were seen like a declaration of war by Charles, with the colonists in Peru even rebelling against the crown. The only way Charles could get back control over his colonies, especially Peru, was to pull back many of the new laws. This back and forth between the Spanish colonists and Charles over how the natives should be treated persisted throughout Charles's entire reign. In 1550, Charles even called for a moral and theological debate in Valladolid to discuss the ethics behind how the natives were being treated. And it was a fascinating affair and I want to make an entire video about it someday in the future. Charles was fighting against the enslavement of natives in the encomienda system all the way till the end of his reign. Nearing his abdication, some of his royal advisors, along with his son Philip, pushed back against Charles's discontinuation of the encomienda system and the new laws. They stated the encomienda system is the only remedy for the conservation and pacification of those lands. Charles replied, I have never liked this measure as you know, and I have always tried to avoid it later stating to his son that once he inherits the kingdom, you can do what you like, and you can sign the relevant orders because it will all be yours, and I will not need to overcome my scruples. Even though Charles had problems with enslaving the indigenous peoples of the Americas, whom he viewed as his subjects, he did not have problem with granting numerous licenses to ship African slaves to the Americas to fill the labor shortages created by an absence of indigenous slaves. African, in this instance, initially meant just the continent. Slave trade based on what we would today call race wasn't fully developed yet. Therefore, African meant the people from the geographical area of Africa, which had an ample supply of non-Christian slaves. This meant that during Charles's and his grandfather's reigns, not just sub-Saharan Africans were sent to the Americas, but also some Moors and Berbers. The number of Moors and Berbers sent to the Americas, however, was extremely small, because the Spanish were afraid of tainting the new world with infidel ideology. Charles's court even introduced a law in 1543, which echoed earlier royal decrees, prohibiting the introduction of any new Moorish slaves into the Americas as they were afraid the Muslims would have contaminating effect on the new Christians. This is why it was during Charles's reign that only sub-Saharan Africans began to be shipped as slaves into the Americas, which was a major step towards the development of racial-based slavery. The impact of Charles's reign on the Americas was huge, but as already stated, at the time, Charles's priority was always Europe, and America was very much secondary in most of his decisions. And one of those decisions, in fact his last royal decision, was to abdicate. On 25th of October, 1555, Charles entered the royal hall in Brussels, walking very slowly due to gout, and having to be supported with a cane on one side and by William of Orange, who was one of Charles' most trusted advisors, on the other. Charles then took out seven pieces of paper on which he wrote his speech, and with tears in his eyes he began to speak. Some of you will remember that on the 5th of January of this year, exactly 40 years had passed since the day when, in this same hall, at the age of 15, I received the rule over the Belgian provinces from my paternal grandfather, Emperor Maximilian. Soon thereafter, the death of my maternal grandfather, King Ferdinand, brought to me the rule over an inheritance that my mother was too ill to administer. Thus, at the age of 17, I sailed over the sea to take possession of the Kingdom of Spain. When I was 19, upon the Emperor's death, I undertook to be a candidate for the Imperial Crown, not to increase my possessions, but rather to engage myself more vigorously in working for the welfare of Germany and my other provinces, namely the Belgian provinces, and in the hopes of thereby bringing peace among the Christian peoples and uniting their fighting forces for the defense of the Catholic faith against the Ottomans. It was partly the German heresy, and partly the envoy of rival powers that prevented me from fully achieving the goal of my efforts. With God's help, I have nonetheless never ceased resisting my 
exposed or striving to fulfill my mission. The campaigns I undertook, some to begin wars and some to make peace, took me nine times to Germany, six times to Spain, seven times to Italy, four times to France, twice to England and twice to Africa in a total of four great journeys. Not to mention the less important visits I paid over the years to my individual realms. I have crossed the Mediterranean Sea eight times and sailed the Atlantic Ocean three times, not counting the journey that I plan to make next, with God's blessing, which would make four. Against my enemies I accomplished what I could, but success in war lies in the hands of God, who gives victory or takes it away as he pleases. As I withdraw, I beg you to be loyal to your princes and to maintain a firm understanding among yourself. Above all, avoid those new sects that plague our neighboring lands. I nonetheless declare to you that I never knowingly or willingly acted unjustly or with unjust force, nor did I ever command or empower another to do so. If actions of this kind are nevertheless justly laid to my account, I formally assure you now that I did them unknowingly and against my own intention. I therefore beg those present today, whom I have offended in this respect, together with those who are absent, to forgive me. My sight and my memory are no longer what they used to be, and increasingly I feel too weak and feeble to undertake the tasks required to protect you and this country. That is the main reason why I have decided to return to Spain and abdicate. Charles would spend most of the remainder of his life in a monastery in Spain where he would eventually die in 1558 at the age of 58. The legacy of Charles V is enormous. There are many things about his life that I couldn't have possibly covered in just one video. From his personal motto plus ultra, which is on the Spanish flag to this day, to his impact on the emergence of modern countries like the Netherlands, Charles' life literally fills up thousands of pages of academic books. Therefore, I will end with two quotes from Rebecca Boone and William Maltby, who I think summarized Charles' life the best. The figure of Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, looms large over a wide swath of human experience in the 16th century. His empire impacted the direction of history in the Americas, Europe and the Middle East. The military, diplomatic and dynastic force of his empire weighed on cultural movements that included the Reformation, Renaissance, Print Revolution, Witch Trials, Global Trade and Colonization. Every generation has found him relevant, but for different reasons with William Maltby stating, Few lives and few eras in the history of the world have been more filled with dramatic events or more important to the future development of both Europe and America than that of Charles V. His reign defies historical comparison. Well, that was a video. If you want to know more, I recommend reading Emperor, A New Life of Charles V by Jeffrey Parker. It was the main source of information for this video. Other than that, uh, I don't know, press the bell icon? Like, why not? It's not gonna bite, it's just a bell. An innocent bell that just wants to be pressed. Anyways, um, I'm very grateful to all my patrons, especially my deity tier patrons, Rohan, Crafty Criminalist, and Brian Lafata. As always, my name is Emlazer, and stick around for history.